a condition with the hands and, and the skin that's easily recognized. You look at it and you can see it. And you have Mike uh, talk about a condition where you have difficulty breathing. You don't have any choice. I mean, it's easily recognizable. And now I'm talking about hearing loss, a condition that comes on with as we age. Uh, usually occurs or becomes visible when we left work. Uh, so in terms of recognition, uh, both in the WSIP platform and outside, it's, it's highly, highly unrecognized and underdiagnosed. Um, so today my talk is on noise-induced noise, noise hearing loss and I'll concentrate on the prevention. There's not too much statistics and studies. Um, let me figure out how this thing works. Uh, so when, when it comes to noise, it's, we're not only exposed in the workplace, we're also exposed out in our social environment at home. Um, it's become ubiquitous, it's, it's more a phenomenon of our modern society uh, and it needs to be recognized as such. Uh, I'll cover the uh, epidemiology, pathology, some definitions and recommendations. Uh, like I said, it's everywhere, all over the place. So if, if you look at evolution, we developed the ability to speak and hear in terms of communication and as a protective mechanism. So we listen to danger, that's our safety mechanism and we can either you know, stand and fight because of what we can hear or we can run away. Um, noise is defined as unwanted sound. As I said, it could be from our workplace or from our environment. And the health effects of noise and noise damage has been greatly under uh, reported, understudied, and under recognized. And we find nowadays um, it's been studied more in all different environments. And the most important, the most studied component of uh, hearing loss has been occupational hearing loss. Some quick terms temporary te threshold shift means you're exposed to noise, your hearing adapts in a, in a, in a certain me mechanism, uh, you, you get a downsloping of your, of your, your audiogram. <coughs> It may last up to 24 hours, 48 hours maximum usually, and you recover back to regular hearing. Permanent threshold shifts means basically you have permanent damage to your hearing. Press by cusis is uh, hearing loss due to age. Usually starts around the age of 50. Um, in Ontario, by the WSIB, it's recognized as uh, something starting as at age 60, and there's a correction factor where they take out that um, hearing loss. Tinnitus is just constant ringing in the ears. It can be you know, something ringing, whooshing, pressure-like sensation in the ear. Um, kind of the anatomy of the ear quickly, you have your outer ear, middle ear, inner ear. Uh, from the membrane, that way is the outer ear. The three bones and the tympanic membrane is the middle ear, and this is the sensory nervous part of the, on the inside, uh, making up the inner ear. So if we look at the inner ear, um, that's your semicircular canal. And that's that part. That's the semicircular canal. That's that's the main organ involved in hearing. Um, sorry, that's a cochlea. I'm saying semicircular. That's your semicircular canal. They involved in uh, equilibrium and balance, and that's a cochlea involved in hearing. So we, we are concentrating on the um, cochlea, and that's the inside of the cochlea. Three ducts. So your sound travels via there, strikes your tympanic membranes. There's three bones here, the three smallest bones in the body. It gets amplified. It moves along the duct all along there and it comes out here. So it depends on the intensity and the frequency of the sound. It creates a pressure and it, it from there it moves across that way. So depends on this, this will affect or be interpreted in where you hear and how you hear. This is a cross section of that, the three canals. And this is your ear hair cells that are damaged in there and I'll show you that. So here's the sound pressure that comes in there. It causes the membrane to vibrate depending on the pressure of sound and the movement of the hair. And the movement of the hair is the nerve impulses that are transmitted to the brain and where you interpret your sound. Uh, this is just another cross section. And the, this, this is a normal hair-like structures in the cochlea. So, so that, that would be considered normal. This would be considered permanent damage. Uh, you can see you have the loss of hair structures. This is an irreversible <coughs> process. Um, there's no way that does these re regrow in mammals. 
So once once this occurs, that's it. You, your hearing is lost. Uh, this is a true <coughs> cross section of of the cochlea. Um, hair cell regeneration. This is the biggest thing around. I mean, this, this article is a little bit old. Um, so hopefully, we'll have. Um, new medication coming out in the next five, ten years, something that will help us <coughs> with hair cell regeneration and stem cell research is heading in this direction. But it's not, not something we can hang our hat on or depend on at this stage. So there's three types of hearing loss, sensory, neural, conductive and mixed. Um, if I go back, so conductive hearing loss will be involving the first two parts of the ears. There's a problem with transmission. And sensory neural will be in the new, in the sensory part of the ear, in the inner ear, and mixed it affects both both parts of the ear. Uh, noise induced hearing loss is due to noise. It's second only to age uh, related <coughs> hearing loss. Prevention is the main um, uh, main avenue to prevent uh, noise induced hearing loss. Um, it's a complex condition. It, it's influenced by environmental uh, conditions, workplace conditions, and genetics plays a big part. Uh, everyone exposed to noise doesn't get um, hearing loss. Uh, genetic factors are important. All age groups, age groups can be affected. Uh, with the advent of MP3 players and uh, portable speakers and a noisy uh, society and noise all over the place, we're finding that uh, it's affecting people at a younger and younger age group. Uh, uh, prevalence is highly related to age. Uh, it can be due to a single loud uh, explosion or it can be due to, due to continuous longer term ex uh, exposure. Um, in Ontario we have the 3 decibel doubling rule. Basically if your uh, exposure increases by 3 decibel um, after the legal limit of 85, your time of exposure is uh, decreased. Um, this is a logarithmic scale so you know 3 decibels is a significant increase. Uh, exposure can be transient, continuous. Uh, most noise in workplaces are a combination of uh, continuous background noise with, with uh, superimposed impulse noises. And like I said, the pathology is due to the loss of the hair cells. Uh, I showed you this diagram <coughs> before, with loss of hair cells. Hair cells cannot regenerate. Prevention is the only current option to preserve hearing. Uh, the hearing, this, this is very important because hearing loss is mild to profound. Mild hearing loss is unrecognized. Um, you leave work, you age, people put it down to aging. Uh, profound hearing loss, you know, it's social isolation. You can't talk, you can't communicate, and we discuss the protective nature of hearing. Uh, when it comes to noise induced hearing loss, this is a decelerating process. So your first uh, few years of exposure for the first five to 10 years is when you get the greatest loss and after that, uh, because there's already damage done, there's less and less uh, to get damaged. So the later on, in, in, as time goes on, the hearing loss becomes less. Uh, Age-related hearing loss is the opposite. As, as time goes on, your loss becomes more and more. Uh, once the noise, uh, exposure to noise is discontinued, there is uh, no substantial further hearing loss related to noise. Uh, previous noise-induced hearing loss does not make the ear more sensitive to future uh, noise exposure. Uh, we know that um, the effects of noise is in the higher frequency, 3000 to 6000 uh, hertz range. Typically we see the uh, 4000 kilohertz uh, notch, 400 kilohertz, uh, has been a classic finding. Uh, the lower frequencies that we use for communication are, not, are less affected. Uh, this is a typical notch there at 4,000 hertz. Uh, it's a typical pattern of noise-induced hearing loss, and it's symmetrical between the uh, it's, yeah right and left. Um, yeah, it's usually symmetrical. If it's asymmetrical, it may be related to the fact that uh, your exposure is greater on one side than the others. For example, truck drivers driving with the windows open or or certain types of gunfire. Uh, when it's asymmetrical from a medical perspective, you want to exclude other pathology, for example, uh, something localized in the ear for a tumor. Um, I discussed this, uh, it's uh, related to damage to the cochlea, it's preventable. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, we know prevention has been uh, personal protective equipment. 
it's a strategy that hasn't worked. Uh, therefore, we've seen the few identified cases much later in, in life. And in terms of the hierarchy of controls, in terms of industrial hygiene, uh, the, the personal protective equipment is right at the bottom, but when it comes to hearing loss, uh, that's what, uh, or when it comes to hearing protection, that's what everyone has uh, uh, concentrated on. For various reasons, we know that the hearing protection programs have not been successful. Um, if they were successful, we wouldn't be seeing the numbers of uh, hearing loss cases that we are seeing currently. Um, there's no direct impact on, on, the, on, on the people being exposed. By the time it's a typical occupational disease, from the time of exposure till the time of disease is, is many years. Uh, this is a very sl slow process, the changes are subtle, the worker compensates, uh, you don't realize you're compensating because you can't hear, you blame other factors. Um, typically a male workforce, you know, it's half the time they don't listen to the spouses, so this is just part of the same thing. Um, and a trend in the modern society is the increase in, in younger people with hearing loss. And what we have to realize is this, this is our future, or at least now, this, this is our current uh, workforce uh, already coming in with some, for, uh, some form of um, hearing loss. Uh, I spoke about this earlier, the certain antioxidants, diet, dietary su supplements, before and after exposure has been shown to be promising. There are currently research studies going on to look at this. Uh, you, these studies are, uh, I mean, common in the uh, U.S. Uh, armed forces. Um, just a brief mention of sound masking. Uh, this is another common thing that's been used nowadays, uh, usually in quite uh, work office, or open concept office spaces, uh, open cubicles, just to mask uh, the sound so you can't hear your co-workers is, you know, they have white noise, sound of water running, or the ventilation system can provide um, uh, a background noise. Usually not an issue, but we have seen cases where workers have complained of headaches and irritability and uh, just general discomfort from this. They're contrasting studies whether it's a problem or not. Uh, we, I'm just mentioning it so it's out there and you can keep an eye for it. Uh, examples of sound pressure, whisper is around 20 decibels, uh, chainsaw is over 100 decibels, and normal conversation around 50 decibels. Um, so there's no clear distinction in modern society, it's like workplace exposure and societal exposure. Uh, the burden of disease is a public health problem. Globally, WHO estimates more than 1.3 billion people. Uh, insidious, uh, insidious onset, uh, like I spoke about how we compensate for it so we don't recognize it. Um, Europe, USA, 26% of adults have bilateral hearing disorder that impairs their ability to hear in noisy environments. Uh, WHO estimated 10% um, exposure. Something on prevention, uh, strategic uh, objectives previously identified and touched on earlier, so I'll just go fast through this. Fo focus on reducing harmful exposures, uh, establish appropriate reporting and surveillance mechanism ensure maximum use of best evidence, improve education and awareness, target high priority exposures and industries, promote ongoing engagement and strategic partnerships. Mm. So in terms of prevention, we need a stronger focus at the source, at, at the source of the noise. And traditionally, like I said, the focus has been on hearing protection. We need incentives in terms of machine design, um, similar to what we had for emissions from cars. What, what we found, there was evolving emissions. When, when it came to motor vehicle emissions, there was evolving levels. You know, the government stepped in and said, by this year we want this level, and five years later we want another level, and we found the strategy very successful, and there were incentives for people to buy these cars, for manufacturers to manufacture these vehicles. And if we look back, you know, what we had 10 or 15 years ago, we find there's a big uh, change in that. So similar in, in incentives are needed in the front end of this, in the design and implementation uh, of machines. Um, MOL and the Chief Prevention Officer needs to provide leadership for this type of work. Uh, this, this is the past WSIB. 
effective hearing conservation uh, program, engineering so solutions to reduce workplace noise, which I discussed, Edu adequate education awareness and training programs, um, baseline and schedule audi audiogram testing, continuous auditing of the effectiveness of hearing conservation programs. Uh, in the hierarchy of controls, uh, elimination of the hazards, which I just discussed, uh, put all your effort up in the front rather than at the end, which we know is not working. Um, usually noise reduction is an afterthought. People design the machine, build the machine, put it in place, and it's up and running, and then say, oh yeah, this level is too high, we need to do something about it. Um, I discussed that. Substitution is kind of similar. Engineering controls in terms of noise, con noise control, you know, um, enclosing the machine in a separate room, uh, dampening devices, etc. The MOL website states the preferred and most effective way to control noise exposure is through engineering controls at the source or along the path of transmission. Administ administrative controls would involve, uh, you know, time uh, spent in, in the working area. Uh, risk assessment, signage, workplace policies, uh, work practices, personal protective equipment I discussed, and these generally have been found uh, not to be as effective. Uh, generally, the, the, the um, noise reduction rating is, is less than what's in the laboratory. Uh, people don't tread to use them properly. Uh, usually, the cheapest product is bought. Um, usually, it's a cultural thing, um, you know, my colleague is not using it, I'm, I'm not going to use it. Uh, there's lack of enforcement or enforcement is poor. Um, the recent KPMG audit done for the WSIB um, identified that either hearing protection, either get no protection whatsoever or the performance of the personal protective equipment is in inadequate and this was two years old. Um, Research has shown that hearing protection was most effective in companies where it was implemented as part of a comprehensive program. Uh, so you can't just use one strategy, you have to combine it to everything. Uh, by quite programs, which I already discussed. So when I looked at this, the recommendations, uh, some of this was made previously, um, which I think are still very relevant. One is to reduce the noise level exposure from 85 decibels, which is currently the legal limit in Ontario, to 80 decibels. Um, what, what we know because of the burden of disease, for whatever reason, is that 85 decibels is still causing us uh, to experience a significant burden of disease. It's, it's far more expensive <clears throat> in terms of hearing aid and treatment um, later on in life. Um, we have studies to show that at 80 decibels is significant uh, better protection. Um, we know that um, at 85 decibels the diseases are still being uh, identified even in, in companies or places where hearing protection has been adequate. If, this reminds me of the uh, alcohol blood levels in Ontario uh, that went from 0 0.08 to 0 0.04. 0.05. I mean, you have your official limit and then you have your action limit, so the recommendation would be at least to come down to an action limit of uh, 80 decibels where, you know, you can offer screening, education, audiograms if needed. Uh, same thing with, with the road alcohol testing. If, if there's an action limit that was went from 0.08 to 0 0.05, at 0 0.05 they'll take away your car, give you a couple of days to rest and uh, give you a talk and then probably get back your car. So this is uh, similar to that recommendation, and this is easily Im Im implemented. Uh, you don't have to legislate it in terms of making it compulsory, but you can make the educational and uh, health testing compulsory at that point, at point, uh, at least at uh, 80 decibels. Um, there are other, other countries that have an action uh, level at 80 decibels, for example, in Europe, uh, which are discussed uh, education, uh, monitoring, the second uh, prevention thing I'll <coughs> cover is the role of chemicals and hearing loss. Uh, this has been recognized. Um, we know that certain chemicals affect hearing. Um, it's, this has been largely ignored both by the compensation system and the medical system. Um, the effect of chemical can be either directly on hearing itself or it can act synergistically with the noise exposure 
at least with the noise to, to cause the disease. Exposure from chemicals can be via the bloodstream, so either you breathe it in or it's absorbed via your uh, skin, and gets into your blood system and ends up into your brain or your inner ear. Uh, or it's direct physical exposure to um, into your ear canal and via, via that route. So it can affect the structure and the functioning and the peripheral or the central nervous system. For the earring, it'll be the central nervous system, obviously. Um, so the pattern of damage from autotoxic chemicals, mimic age-related age earring loss. Uh, the exposure threshold for chemicals in terms of earring loss is unknown. Uh, so if we don't know something, what, would, what should our approach be? And I'll give you some examples here. The US Army Public Health uh, Command has recommended audiograms for workers whose airborne exposure without regard to respiratory protection warn are at 50% or more of the occupational exposure limit. So the, the Army is saying that if you are exposed to 50% of the official limit, we should start testing you in terms of your hearing. And they made this recommendation based on the fact that we just don't know. If we knew, it will be something else, but because we don't know, we should uh, implement the precautionary principle, start monitoring our workforce, and then we can use this data to change as we go along. And this is quite a stringent level. Um, it's more than uh, OSHA or the uh, ACGIH uh, recommendations. Uh, we have the Nordic group in Europe uh, that kind of tried to classify uh, chemicals b based on what is known and they divide it into you know, likely causes, suspected causes and unlikely causes, uh, known causes, styrene, toluene, carbon disulfide, uh, lead, mercury, carbon uh, monoxide, suspected causes. Um, in, in, in my report, I kind of went with the US Army. I just put the list out there to say, if we don't know, this is the list. So you should be looking at it. Uh, ra rather than trying to you know, be restrictive and identify one or two chemicals and, and just concentrate on that. Because if, if we don't know, we should be obviously looking far more uh, with an open mind. The, the other thing is the recognition of the non-auditory effects of noise. For a long time, for a very, very long time, all we did was concentrate on hearing loss. But now we know that uh, noise exposure causes a whole, other, whole lot of other health effects. And these health effects are, you know, either at an individual level or at a level of society itself. Um, it can affect your autonomic nervous system and your cortisol levels, which is your stress hormones. Uh, it's been linked to hypertension, cardiovascular disease, psychological effects of hearing loss. Um, if you can't hear, you feel ignored, you feel isolated. Um, uh, undiagnosed hearing loss has been implicated in increase in accidents. Uh, the WSIB sites list uh, the following health effects, high blood pressure, increased risk of heart disease, increased stress levels, tiredness, irritability, hormone changes, and low birth uh, weight babies. Um, so we, from a public health, we know that noise exposure leads to annoyance, disturbed sleep, causes daytime sleepiness. Uh, in hospitals, it affects patients' out outcomes, staff performance. Uh, hospitals have been studied a lot because from a patient's perspective and, and from the people that work in the hospitals, tend to run 24 hours, you always hear the pages on, you know, at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, and they expect people to be sleeping and resting and recuperating and getting better. Uh, uh, I just got two more and I'll okay. be done. <laughs> Uh, pregnancy and noise induced hearing loss. Um, so, the recommendation would be prevent noise exposure more than 80 decibels, give the pregnant people the option not to work in uh, noisy environments because of preterm labor and small world babies. I'll skip to that. And community partnerships because of the high burden in society. Uh, it cannot be just an occupational. Um, exposure issue, you have to look at community partnerships in getting the message across. That's, That's it. Nice. Thank you. Sorry for that.